Just want to welcome everybody to the plant party. Today we'll be talking ecology. Uh, this is hosted by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resource Conservation Service. And we have a special presentation today from Texas Native Seeds. Uh, sponsorship for this program is provided by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. And this plant party is a quarterly, quarterly webinar series intended for advanced plant training and fun education for interested parties. So I'm Tim Sigmund. I'm a private lands program leader with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Today are Charles Newper with State Resource Conservationists with the USDA NRCS and Megan Clayton, Extension Rain Specialist with Texas a and AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, we have 19 wonderful door prizes we'll be giving away today. And we'd like to thank Bayer Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, Douglas King Seeds, Native American Seed Company, Hogue Agri Partners, Texas Brigades, and the USDA NRCS for donating these prizes. So as we said, we'll be moving through this uh, real quickly. Uh, we have five presentations today. And uh, for now, I'll turn it over to Charles as we introduce our first speaker uh, as he begins to share his presentation. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, our first presenter today is going to be Mr. Jason Holt. Jason is a zone range management specialist with the USDA NRCS located in Bryan, Texas. His primary responsibilities include providing technical assistance, training, and guidance to 38 NRCS field offices throughout East Texas. These field offices deliver technical and financial assistance programs to private landowners interested in conservation-oriented projects. Jason is on the agenda twice today, but his first presentation will cover what ecological site descriptions are and how they're made. Thanks for kicking things off. Over to you, Holt. Thanks, Charles. Um, working through the technology here and just about got it going. Thanks for everybody's patience. Thanks for the invitation to be with everybody this morning. So um, what I'll be doing today is I'll give a two-part talk on ecological site descriptions. In this first section here, um, I'm going to talk about uh, what an ecological site description is in the first place, and I'll give some information about how they are developed. So we will dive right in. Okay, so before we talk about what an ecological site description is, we need to speak about what an ecological site is. So here I've got the official definition for you guys uh, written out where you can see, and it's, it's a division of the landscape. And so it's defined as a distinctive type of land based on reoccurring soils, landforms, hydrology, geology, climate, and so forth. And these different sites grow different types of plants in different kinds of amounts and uh, respond to management and uh, natural disturbances in a similar manner. So I might say that another way, the short version being a certain kind of plant community that grows in a specific place that responds a certain kind of way. So um, to, to think about that, maybe a little bit clear here, we'll take this picture and um, from the high plains and divide this. And so at least in the background, you might say there's probably at least three different ecological sites here. Um, the uplands at the top of your screens and then where it breaks off to the river, these, these steep breaks or draws probably being another ecological site, obviously different uh, productivity, probably different, um, some differences in species composition there. And then of course the river bottom um, being uh, uh, a different plant community and a different suite of species and lots of different dynamics going on there. So each one of these between the black lines here would probably be a different ecological site. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of history about um, the development of ecological site descriptions, I've got the, the timeline of NRCS here, basically, and you can see in not too long after the development of the agency in the 1940s, uh, the first thing we started working with with these concepts of site descriptions were called range site descriptions. And these were um, short reference documents that were three or four pages long that um, generally described how plant communities responded to uh, livestock use. And a few other things, a little bit of uh, a little bit of mention of drought and impacts from fire and so on and so forth. 
And so these started being developed in the 40s. And at that time, bear in mind, there wasn't a lot of soil mapping out there. They were working closely with the soil scientists, but it was very plant oriented. And uh, then as we developed um, into the 1980s and the way thinking uh, developed among the scientific community too, um, we transitioned to the ecological sites instead of range sites. And so these were much more of a, uh, a holistic document, if you will, that um, weren't so focused on livestock that include interpretations for wildlife and all, all kinds of ecolo ecology and biological functions um, that are happening on that site. And about that time too, in the 80s, um, some of the theories about plant ecology really started to develop and we went from this thinking of um, a, a poor, fair, good, excellent range condition to these alternative steady states where you could have these different plant communities and you can move from one plant community to the other if you passed a threshold and one wasn't necessarily worse than the other um, kind of thinking. So we moved um, to a broader way of thinking about ecology at that time, as opposed to some of the thinking you know, from the 40s and 50s, it was more tailored to, to uh, what's uh, probably more typical on the Great Plains, um, central part of the US. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go. Um, talking about the way ecological sites are organized, here I'm bringing up a map of Texas where we've got Texas's uh, major land resource areas. Now, there's several different ways of uh, classifying vegetation and these regions within Texas. You might commonly hear these called ecoregions. These are a little bit more detailed than the ecoregions. If you look, for instance, like on the coast, you'll see a band here for the coast prairie and then a little yellow band here for the saline coast prairie. So they're broken out a little bit more, but basically these are divisions made within the state based on the climate, um, a lot to do with the geology and, um, and, and the, uh, how the plants grow on these different sites here. So you tend to see slightly different uh, dynamics in all these different MLRAs. Obviously there's a big difference from east to west, but even between say the flatwoods and the piney woods, uh, or the Western uh, Coastal Plain, as we call it, um, there can be some different dynamics there. They're fairly substantial. So we have these different MLRAs, and then within the MLRAs, there are suites of soils that are mapped in there. Um, so soils form under all these uh, different processes, including the climate and the geology that's present. And so you might get, oh, just a wild guess here, uh, I don't know, 40, 50, maybe more soil series in a given uh, major land resource area uh, that are mapped throughout that area. And so if we look down at the property level here, here's an example of a property, and this is a soil map from Web Soil Survey, and you'll see several different map units. And I'll draw your attention to like this bottom land site here, and you'll notice that as the creek comes through here, there's enough difference in the soil that they chose to map a different map unit in the bottom there and as well on the uplands here. But when you go to an ecological site map, oftentimes you'll see a, uh, a consolidation, if you will, of these map units where similar soils are different enough to map out, but in terms of what plants they grow and how you would manage them, there's not enough difference to really call them different ecological sites. So moving on to an ecological site map here uh, for the same property, you can see how there's some consolidation here and, and, and all these soils fall into the same bottomland ecological site and many of the upland uh, soil map units were combined as well. All right, so now let's get into the components of an ecological site description and talk about um, where they might come from. And um, in the second talk, I'll talk a little bit more about how you might use each of these components. Okay, so the first thing I'll jump into is the climate features. So imagine that you're from South Dakota and you're decide you're gonna buy a property outside Corpus Christi. And so you might wanna know a lot about what's the growing season length, um, what the weather's gonna be like, how much rainfall you could expect compared to what you're used to, those sorts of things. So the, um, this data comes from weather station data. So there's a, usually a robust, a robust uh, data set there that we can pull from or this will be assembled where you can see how many frost free days you might get, how long your growing season is, what the average rainfall is, and then some sort of estimation of the distribution of that rainfall throughout the year. So that gives you, a, you know, an, an idea of 
um, you know, your the length of the growing season and how long you might be grazing, growing forage, or, you know, there might be some other goals that you got there. So the climate section is pretty straightforward, but there's some interesting data there. You know, again, especially if you're brand new to an area, um, that can be really helpful. All right, and then the next session uh, that you'll find on an ecological site description would be the water features. And so on some of your upland sites, there's not much to say, um, especially moving into the arid part of the state. But, um, you know, throughout the landscape, there'll be these water receiving positions, and especially as the landscape flattens out in certain places, these water features can become important. So there's a there's an example here on the screen of one of the narratives and water feature section that talks about, you know, some potential for hydric soils. Um, but at uh, any rate, uh, these water features are often be influenced by floodplains, uh, could be high water tables or depressional areas that might receive water. And so that can impact how that plant community can be managed and the suite of species that might grow there. Okay, and then soil features. Well, obviously we have a, a large soil mapping program um, within our agency and these soil maps are available. And these features, um, these features are something that you can look at. Uh, there'll, be a, uh, there'll be several soil series that are correlated with an ecological site. You know, it's very common for there to be, you know, six or eight soil series within a major land resource area. Uh, correlated with a particular ecological site. But in the soil section, what you'll find there is information about the depth of the soil, um, how permeable it might be, how water moves through it, and also information about uh, rock fragments, drainage, ponding, flooding, some of those type features that would be important to consider, you know, if you're um, interested in, say, taking some sort of action on that site, you know, it might be as simple as where you're thinking about locating a fence or how you might want to use that site or where you're going to put a food plot. Even. Okay, so the nuts and bolts of the site description is the plant ecology section. And there's several things um, in this part of the ecological site description. There'll usually be a narrative of the ecological dynamics that happen on that site that tells you how you move between plant communities. There will be a state and transition model that talks about the different types of communities you might expect to find on there and how you move between them. And there'll be a historic climax plant community list. So this is an estimation of what the plant community was thought to be basically at the time of European settlement. So you're using a lot of historical records uh, there, sometimes these relic sites um, that we think resemble that historic community are really hard to find, um, but you know, sometimes not. So uh, we'll, use, uh, we'll use those types of things to develop uh, that estimation of that plant community. And then there'll be production estimates and plant growth curves uh, on a lot of these sites. The source for the majority of this data, um, there's three things. There's historical records, there's data that's been previously collected through various monitoring programs within NRCS, SES, and other sources, and then a lot of professional experience. It's, uh, it's, really, uh, it's really a gem to have some, um, some resources, some individuals that have, you know, oftentimes the people that really chime in on this section and write these narratives might have, you know, two, three, maybe four decades worth of experience working in a particular region and seeing how it responds to drought, wildfire, insect damage, so on and so forth. And so that's where a lot of that comes from. All right, uh, real quick, I'll throw in that you might uh, encounter um, more than one type of uh, ecological site description, it, depending on where you're at in the state or the US. Realize there's both forested ecological sites and range ecological sites. And they'll have either an F or an R beside the site ID number. Um, so the obvious difference there is the historic climax community on a forest site um, is going to be tree dominated, or have a tree canopy on it, where on a range site, it'll be dominated by herbaceous plants. Okay, so getting into a state and transition model, here's an example of one, and you can see in this particular uh, site, it has a savanna state, and, it, and then if you exceed a threshold, it can move to a shrubland state and then from there it could go to a woodland state and if you wanted to go um, 
back to the savannah-like state. There's these, these arrows with these descriptors down here that would tell you what it might take to get from one box to the other. And so um, each of these plant communities will be described in the site description in a narrative and have some other values associated with them. And like I think I said earlier here, the thinking has really evolved that, you know, there are times where these alternative steady states exist and they're not necessarily degraded. Now, there could easily be degraded if there's been a lot of soil erosion that's happened, but sometimes one sort of disturbance or another, you might have, you know, a site that's in the shrubland state and a site that's in the savanna state, and it's not necessarily the result of bad management or something like that. Okay, and then one thing I really like is, is, is the authors will do their best to get a picture of each of these plant communities, what they might look like. So for habitat managers, and landowners, you know, that's really handy uh, to see what the potential of the land might be and also to help identify the current state um, that it's in. Uh, there will be production estimates and it will be total production. So not just forage, it'll be grasses and grass likes, tree production, for production, shrub and vine. And oftentimes be aware there'll be a pretty wide range in production there. So there'll be some, some values given there. And that'll be done for each plant community um, that occurs on that site. And then here's an example of a uh, species composition table of that historic uh, Climax plant community that you can find on these sites. So um, it's an estimation of the relative abundance of the species that occur there. So that's handy. And then uh, a lot of the range sites will have plant growth curves that tells you what time of the year you could expect forage production to occur. So if you're doing any kind of grazing planning and drought monitoring, sort that sort of thing, uh, this, these could be uh, very useful as well. And then finally, there'll be an animal community interpretation page and I'm sorry, a, a narrative that'll be in there. Now, previously we had some tables about preference for plant parts. And I believe that the, the site has been, um, uh, most of those have been pulled out of there and there's a more general uh, description of what habitats might occur on the site for various species, both game and non-game. And with that, I'll pause right there and turn it back to Charles. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. We'll look more forward to more uh, talk on ESDs from you a little bit later. Uh, but up next, we'll have Mr. Tim Sigmund. Tim was born and raised in Giddings, Texas. He received his bachelor's, in, bachelor's degree and was a graduate re research assistant at Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches, Texas, and followed that with employment with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in 2009. In College Station, Tim was responsible for seven counties performing wildlife surveys, public outreach, technical guidance, prescribed fire assistance, public hunting opportunities, wildlife tax valuation planning, and dealing with other wildlife issues. Starting November 1st in 2017, Tim began his role as a private lands program leader for Texas Parks and Wildlife dealing with private lands issues in a statewide capacity. Tim resides in College Station with his wife and three children. Today, he'll be speaking about using plants as indicator species. So take it away, Tim. All right, thank you, Charles, appreciate that. So uh, our talk today about indicator plants builds on a lot of what Jason was talking about there about some of those state transition models and trying to interpret what condition the land you're looking at is now and what those plants are telling you about the geology, hydrology, soils, and so on, and how it relates to how you make your decisions moving forward. So if you take a look at this photo uh, that I have here on the title slide, you can kind of see if you know much about grasses there in the foreground on the left, that's a nice big blue stem plant. Um, there's a fairly good distribution of forbs and grasses in this photo, and so it may look like a fairly healthy grassland to you, but you don't know if it's been uh, planted, restored, whatever else, and you can build from that. But what you do know is that there's some good climax bunch grasses there, and apparently it's, they're at least being able allowed to flower during certain times of the year for their reproduction. <clears throat> so what is an indicator plant species? And so these are plants that may be common or uncommon in abundance, but are only found in particular regions, hydrologies, soil types, geologic formations, or management regimes that are readily identifiable by you as the manager. And so they're usually giving you further clues about the environment that they're in and maybe the rainfall and all those other factors we talked about earlier, 
or the way they've been managed either recently or historically uh, at the site they're found at that time. So an example that I see in a few counties here in East Central Texas, where I was located around College Station, uh, one of those was Nuttall's Rayless Goldenrod. If I saw that growing in the area, I knew that it would probably have a sandstone parent material. Uh, it was usually on dry, relatively unproductive sites or moderately productive or it was on a rock outcrop. Uh, so it could be an indicator of a glade where I might find other rare plant species or plant species of conservation concern. And so some of the more common ones you might see and one that we all probably recognize is kind of that roadside indicator plant uh, or a railroad track right away or something other, some other protected area. So here, this is a county road out in Western Williamson County, almost on the Burnett County line. And inside that nine wire fence, I've got a lot of brush encroachment from uh, juniper trees. Um, I'm pretty much grazed down to the soil. Really difficult for me to identify what that Climax plant community, community may have been like without referencing a soil survey because there's no uh, standing vegetation to go off of based on the management inside that fence line. So as I'm driving to meet that landowner, I can already make an assessment on what they're doing to that property uh, or what had been done to that property historically versus what would have been there, uh, you know, pre-European settlement, as Jason said, what that reference plant community may have been. Because if you look, even though the county mowed that fence line, I can tell right there along the edge where it hadn't been mowed and it hasn't been grazed, there was little blue stem, yellow Indian grass, Canada wild rye, there was Maximilian sunflower, uh, prairie blazing star, and lots of other perennial forbs growing there. So I know that that soil site is capable of uh, producing those plants, but they've been eliminated, whether it be through management decisions recently or in the past, shape the conversation before I ever get in the gate uh, with that person and try to figure out what their goals and objectives are. Other things that you can see when we talk about hydrology. So I visited this site during a dry period. But when I was able to go out there and look at the vegetation that was on this site, there on the left-hand side up against those juniper trees, this soil site is extremely sandy. It's on the outcrops of the Carrizo Wilcox Aquifer. And so in that area, sometimes you can have sands that are greater than 30 feet deep uh, that are more than 85% sand in their uh, makeup in those soils. But in this area, I noticed that there's lots of bushy blue stem. So there's no standing water at this point because we were in about a four month drought. Uh, but with that bushy blue stem being there, I know that its growth habit is generally around water sources or in wet or at least seasonally wet areas. So this can tell me a couple things, either if, it, if it's kind of on the periphery of a certain area that it, there's usually seasonal water there if it's broadly spread throughout an area, it can tell me that maybe the water table is high there. So this may be an area that I would focus on if I was looking from a livestock management standpoint or from a uh, supplemental water resource standpoint, an area where pond construction may be a good idea relative to other areas with a higher sand content, or there may be a shallow water table here. So a solar pump and a trough may be a lot more economical uh, in this location than it would be somewhere else on the property. And that one plant told me all those things as I make my decisions about how I'm managing my property. Other things to look at in a more traditional range management landscape is sometimes in your pastures, if you're looking at your grazing and what's going on, uh, you'll have those highly preferred plants that you want to uh, protect and keep because they have your highest productivity, palatability, and so on to keep your property profitable and to keep your animals in good condition. And so. Uh, it may be difficult for some of you all to see, but <clears throat> these plant species are this plant here in the foreground, there's a couple of bunches of it spread around here, but, but that's yellow Indian grass. So a highly palatable, tall grass, prairie plant uh, that has a, a fair amount of forage production. And in this photo, I took it a since the last rainfall event. This was mid-August on this property, uh, but the grass is still roughly about six to eight inches tall. And that's about as low as I would want to grow it without maybe doing some uh, lasting damage down to the uh, root system and its ability to put on new forage growth after, during its rest period. Because if you look closely, you'll notice every single leaf blade has been clipped at that height. So if I continue to leave my cattle in that, I need to clip it down, 
I may reduce my long-term productivity for that site. So maybe I use Indian grass as my indicator plant for how intensely I'm grazing this site or how long I want to be on it. Other plants as you move out west, this is from the Trans-Pecos area, just west of Alpine. <clears throat> uh, as you look at this, this is creosote bush. And so these large creosote bush flats are something that have occurred and expanded over the desert southwest and Chihuahuan desert of Texas uh, over the last hundred years. These historically, from historical records and accounts, as Jason mentioned, would have been uh, short grass, uh, desert grasslands, very important for pronghorn antelope, cattle grazing, grassland wintering birds, and things such as that. Overgrazing, really almost over a century ago, um, decreased grass abundance and, a lot, and increased the uh, shrub abundance of creosote bush. And now we pretty much have hundreds of thousands of acres of creosote bush monocultures. So the only way you can deal with that uh, in a lot of instances, is to either do mechanical control or what they did here was aerial control with herbicide to try to restore it to its natural, natural function of grassland to improve habitat for, in this case, they were hoping to improve habitat for pronghorn and also to improve water quality. And so transition it back to something like this. Unfortunately, that's almost an eight year process from when they started to spray to when it reverted to looking something like this after reseeding uh, to the short grass system that they wanted. Other situations that you might come into are situations the property that I visited in the Fayette Prairie. So I had never been there before. So I was, I had never visited with the landowner, never seen the property, but my knowledge of the area is that it's been highly fragmented. Uh, it'd been farmed in various ways and means for almost 200 years. Some of the area that was most recently and first colonized in Texas. Um, and when I got out there, the landowner had done some management. He had shredded that winter. And so I really didn't have a lot of the previous year's growth to go off of to know what I was looking at as this landowner was hoping to do some grassland restoration work. And so what I was looking at, I needed to know what was there now. Uh, is it native or invasive? As that would shape our ideas as we try to do a grass, grassland restoration to restore it to a tall grass prairie. Um, what is the work that we would need to do? How intensive would it be? And what are the options and tools the landowner had available to them? And so as we rode around on the property, <clears throat> you know, and with not a lot to go on based on what had been shredded, we came across a couple of areas that hadn't. And I've got some circles drawn here on, on a plant species that I noticed as we were going along. And I noticed that one first. And what that is, is called wild hyacinth. It's a member of the lily family. And it's usually an indicator of a fairly intact prairie community that has not been plowed. Um, and so I started looking a little closer in this area and down here in the bottom, I noticed some little two carex microdonta, which is usually an indicator of an unplowed blackland prairie. And then I started seeing some perennial forbs back in here is Maximilian sunflower. So all of these things are telling me I've got perennial forbs uh, that are usually indicative of an unplowed area uh, with some good species diversity. So this might be an area I wanna take a look at and maybe worthy of long-term conservation because of its rarity in the landscape now. This used to be a three and a half million acre tall grass prairie that's been reduced now to roughly less than of anything that's in naturalized or even degraded condition uh, from what it was. And so this is a close up of that wild hyacinth flower and a look at its growth habit from, the, from that bulb and shooting up there in the latter part of March. And so we went back later on that fall with, a, uh, with our botanist from Parks and Wildlife. We were able to identify several different areas on the property that had not been plowed and representative inclusions from the Edwards Plateau uh, on the Oakville or Fleming geologic formations. And so we had a bunch of green lilies, all those white spikes you see sticking up are usually more commonly found in the Texas Hill Country and Edwards Plateau. Uh, but we had an area of the property in the soil and the hydrology that was there that really had a robust population of those. And we found more good prairie plants further on that had been shredded off, uh, really strong stands of switchgrass, yellow Indian grass, compass plant, big blue stem as well. And we ended up documenting 216 species of plant in a single visit. And that was all because in that March, I was able to spot that one flowering plant uh, that instead of giving just, you know, whole soul, let's nuke it and start over, we were able to say, hey, Let's, let's really take a hard look at what we have, a good inventory of what we have before we make any further decisions, because this is an indicator of a high quality. 
Another example of sometimes uh, having an indicator habitat and knowing where plants may be found. Uh, this was a property in Robertson County that was looking to do some long-term conservation of their property. And I went out there to meet with the landowner and have a discussion. And as we looked around, I realized, hey, this has got the right soil types. It's a clay pan. So uh, it's got a sandy loam topsoil with a clay pan roughly six to 18 inches below the soil. Water a lot in the wintertime which usually means you'll have less yopon growth in the understory that allows for a healthy herbaceous, you know, grass and poor plant community underneath it. And so that's what we see here when I went out in August of that year. And so again, this was after about a 60, 45 to 60 day drought at this point. Uh, the plant that I thought might grow in this area because of the hydrology and soils and its geographic location in the Brazos River watershed was Navasota Lady Stresses, an endangered orchid native only to Texas. Um, that is very difficult to find except for when it's flowering in late October. So I told the landowner, hey, I'd like to come back here in October and take a look. Um, this may help your property rank higher if you look to do a conservation easement as you're seeking to do uh, based on what I'm seeing here. And so we went back out that October and in these sunny woodlands along the eroded edges of these uh, small upper uh, creeks as they flowed down towards larger creek systems, we did find a new population to science that had never been documented before. Because of that site visit, knowing that that was a unique geologic and hydrologic feature, uh, and we had this indicator plant showing that it's uniqueness. It only occurs in, in the few counties in the world. And so there it is, uh, only standing about a foot to 18 inches tall. Um, Navasota lady stresses in the Sporanthes genus, and with a close up of the flower spikes there as it was growing in late October rather than the spring, like a lot of our other native orchids that grow. So those indicator plants tell me that I'm in a fairly unique spot uh, geologically, climatically, uh, related to the soils and the hydrology, where it can only be found. It's usually not found much more than 100 feet from those eroded stream banks. Uh, so a very, very unique area to find it. And if you find it, you know you've identified all those things. And, uh, you can use it as a good indicator of unique plant system that has been rarely disturbed uh, from human activity. And so what you're really looking for when you're looking for those indicator plants, rather than that's definitive of the entire state or trying to make a list, you need to recognize the plants that will show the narrative they're trying to tell you for your local area. Figure out what they are. Are you looking at great plants that are trying to tell you about your grazing? Are you trying to look for plants that tell you about hydrology? And understand what it's telling you. So geology, hydrology, soils, or those past management decisions, continuous overgrazing, uh, maybe absence of fire from shrub invasion, and use those to help guide your future management and restoration decisions based on your observations and input from the land manager uh, who is helping with those. So with that, I think I'm just about out of time and I will wrap up. So I know that was real quick and dirty, but a couple of good examples of indicator plants there for y'all. I'll toss it back to Charles. Next up, we have Dr. Tony Falk, the Assistant Director of the South Texas Natives Project of the Texas Native Seeds Program. Texas Native Seeds is a program of the Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute located at Texas A&M Kingsville. As the Assistant Director of South Texas Natives, he oversees native seed development and production for the South Texas Program region. Dr. Falk also oversees all research plantings conducted by the Texas Native Seeds Program. It's all yours, Tony. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna be talking today about converting some of our non-native grasses into native plants. Um, I'm gonna give a real broad overview of some steps to take to do this. Each project that's taken under this is going to have a little bit different steps. That's going to depend on the species you're dealing with, kind of what state the land's currently in, as well as the equipment that's available to you at the time. So these are kind of broad steps to take and give you the tools to, to be able to do the process, but uh, the real prescription is going to kind of depend and be a case-by-case -case basis. So I really wanted to start by kind of laying out out front what we're talking about when we're talking about introduced or another term for that is non-native grasses. Uh, Bermuda grass 
pictured in the bottom right hand corner there is a big one that we get lots of questions on that seems to a lot of people are trying to to get rid of nowadays um, and there's also one that i've heard several people over the years say well that's just that native bermuda grass uh, none of the bermuda grass varieties are native uh, they've all been introduced uh, primarily for forage uh, and erosion control and and other options for like that. Um, Old world blue stems is another big one throughout the state. Um, that's kind of a catch all term uh, to include things like Clayburg, King Ranch, Angleton, Yellow, which most of these have been done primarily for forage production and erosion control historically. Um, again, another set of species that is sometimes referred to as native just because they've been around for so long but none of these old world blue stems uh, are native to the area most of them originate from asia and africa uh, some of the others you see listed johnson grass klein grass uh, those are pretty common throughout the whole state uh, some of the others that are a little bit more regionally specific Buffalo grass is a big one in South Texas, parts of West Texas, Bahia grass for you folks in East Texas, uh, and then layman's love grass and Wilman's love grass as well. So all of these are non-native or introduced grasses. Uh, most of them have fairly poor habitat requirements for wildlife. Uh, they do have their specific uses, um, but if we're looking to return things back to kind of historical or native habitats and native grasslands, we need to look at getting those out of there. So what in general makes this such a difficult process? Uh, it really comes down to the fact that all of these species were introduced because of very specific reasons and they fit specific needs. Um, for example, Bermuda grass, one of the things that makes it such a, a outstanding competitor, I would say, is that it can self prune. In other words, it can cut itself off of tissue that has been affected by, say, herbicides or mowing, preserving the root mass and being able to regrow. Buffalo grass has dormant buds in the plant base, which again, give it the ability to regrow after having sort of an initial herbicide treatment. Uh, Johnson grass has the ability to produce roots and produce new shoots from different cut parts of the plant. Um, so disking in that situation may not be the best option. Uh, in general, all of these species have the ability to produce extreme amounts of seed and extreme amounts of biomass uh, with very little moisture and an extremely quick amount of time. So now that I've given all the doom and gloom, the good, the good news is, is that this can be done. Uh, we have shown on several occasions that we can convert these areas that have been dominated by introduced grasses back to native habitats and native plants. Now, the kind of four things that have to be taken into account when doing that is you must be diligent in the process. You can't just get this started and then halfway through change your mind. Um, think, well, I'll get to it later. The series of steps that I'm going to talk about, you've got to stay with the process. Secondly, it's not necessarily going to be cheap. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a silver bullet at this point, a, a one-time treatment, um, something that this is just going to be an easy fix. Um, again, as part of doing things, being diligent, you can't just do it halfway. Um, if you're going to commit to the process, you've got to be fully committed. And then finally, scale is important. Um, unfortunately, at this point, there are introduced grasses pretty much across the landscape. Um, and what that does is almost creates a constant source of these species to invade our native grasslands or our con converted areas. Um, so the larger the scale that you can undertake this process, the better off you're going to be because you're going to limit that edge and that area that those non-native species can reintroduce. So how do we go about doing the process? Well, the first thing that needs to be done is you need to remove the existing vegetation. And there's several different ways that that can be done. Um, and I can, I'm going to go into each of these in more detail in subsequent slides. Then we want to make sure that we're killing and removing the 
non or the plants that are currently there. Third, we want to mine that seed bank. We want to get rid of all of the seed and other potential plant material that's still left. And then finally, replace what we got rid of with what we would prefer to have in a more desirable species. So removing the existing plant material. There's several ways we can do that. As I had in that first, the previous slide, fire is an excellent way to do that if that's available to you. Um, it's a cheap, inexpensive way to remove all of that built up biomass and existing plant material. Um, a couple of options that you can do depending on the equipment you have or if you have grazing animals available um, is you can cut and bale that vegetation. Um, that could provide an income stream for you throughout the process um, and is an excellent way to remove all of that biomass that those plants have built up prior to starting the process. Using livestock to graze the grasses down is another excellent way to be able to remove that standing material that those plants have produced. Um, the whole reason for wanting to do this is that we want to start treating those existing plants and getting whatever treatment we're going to apply directly to the root mass. If not, you end up with a situation like you see in the bottom right hand corner there where that disc just started rolling over the plant material that was there. We're not really contacting any soil. We're not treating the bases of those plants. We're really just balling up and dealing with biomass that's above the ground. So once we get rid of all of the above biomass, then we want to start treating the root and the, the plant material that's there at the ground level. Um, mechanically, how we can do that is through disking. There's a lot of different disks out there. They each have their pros and cons. Um, one that I, I like to mention that a lot of people are often scared about is mow board plowing. Um, you know, that's received a lot of bad attention historically, um, but if available, although slow, this is an excellent way to be able to break out some of these areas that have been, that have had non-native grasses on them for an extended period of time and as a, a very effective way at controlling those existing plants. Uh, if we're going to use herbicides, which is an excellent route to go as well, um, would suggest using some high rates of broad spectrum herbicides such as glyphosate. Um, what we really want to make sure we're doing is using that herbicide directly to that root mass and treating those roots. I really can't say that enough. And that's really a big deal with these, all of these non-natives that have large amounts of built up biomass. Um, additionally, don't be afraid to use species specific herbicide. Um, Johnson grass is one that comes to mind. There's several products out there that are, that are developed and specific to Johnson grass and are very effective on that. Um, some of our other woody species may, may need to use specific herbicides to treat those along with some of the other more broad spectrum stuff to be able to treat the whole area. Um, Arsenal products, uh, Powerline is one of the common names or trade names that's often used. Um, there's a lot of research out there that those products have been used in the past um, that are broad spectrum and can be highly effective. However, I always like to voice some caution about using that product um, or those types of products. They have shown to be mobile within the soil profile and have shown to, in certain soil types, have extended uh, control, um, therefore preventing anything that you would like to reestablish in those soils. Some other things that you could kind of tie in to doing this conversion as other activities are going on on your property, um, brush work that's been done. Um, you know, if, if we're getting in and we're mechanically treating brush, whether it's through root plowing or, or methods like that, that's an excellent start to this process. Um, those are definitely some of the mechanical ways that can treat those existing plants for you. Um, or energy development is another one. Um, these are kind of, these are both starting points that can be used that aren't necessarily targeted at converting non-natives, but um, can definitely be a way to jump you into the process. 
So after we've controlled the plants that are already there and already established, the next big thing is we want to do what we call mining the seed bank. Um, as I said, all of these non-native grasses are exceptional at producing seed. Uh, you can see in the picture up in the right-hand corner the amount of old world blue stem seed just laying on the ground. Uh, as you can imagine, if that stand's been there for a long time, uh, the amount of seed that is in that soil. So what we're looking at doing here is through either a series of disking or broad spectrum herbicides, repeatedly treating that site for several treatments after subsequent rainfall events. Now, every time I talk about doing this, everybody wants to say, well, how long do I have to do that? Um, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer and I can't give hard timelines on that. Um, it's really going to depend on rainfall. Um, you know, what you're looking at doing is after we've treated that initial vegetation, allowing that site to receive rain, allowing some of that seed to germinate, and then treating it. And every subsequent time you're doing that, you're reducing the possibility of having um, that seed germinate and the number of non-native grasses reestablishing. Um, one of the things that we've seen a lot of people run into as we talk about this is, is the, the kind of go too far mentality. Um, and they'd like to wait and treat that site and treat that site until they absolutely see no more seedlings coming back. Um, you really can't do that realistically. Um, there's always going to be, not always, but for a long period of time, there's going to be seedlings coming back. So we want to do, we want to shoot for three, four times. Um, you can kind of gauge it based as you see those grass seedlings decrease. Um, but at some point you have to make a decision, okay, I'm going to do my seeding at this time and go ahead and make the call. I talked about being diligent. Um, and not being able to go halfway. Uh, these are some pictures that came from some colleagues working with South Texas natives doing some restoration work uh, at in and around the Choke Canyon area. Um, the picture in the top left corner <clears throat> is an area that had been treated two or three times using broad spectrum herbicides after they had treated the initial existing plants. However, there was a sprayer malfunction that had left the area, the taller grass that you see in that picture, um, untreated for one treatment. Uh, the picture in the bottom right-hand corner is directly adjacent to that that had had that, uh, that previous treatment. So you can see pretty quickly how that thing can, can get away from you if you're not able to stay on top of it. When we're replacing things, we want to make sure we leave those final two applications uh, for an herbicide application. So we allow that soil to firm back up. You can kind of see the difference in a too soft soil in the top left and a firm soil in the bottom right. Uh, alternatively, um, you can use some cover crops or lease to ag producers uh, to help mine that soil for you to save some costs. Um, and then after we've mined the soil, uh, treated the existing plants, we want to replace that with appropriate, locally appropriate and site appropriate native vegetation. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there that can help you pick those different species and I've included a link to our seed selection or seed mix selection tool on our website. Uh, and then just real quick, and I'm glad this one's kind of short because this is the part that we know the least about is the management afterwards. Um, Possibly shortly after, you could do some mowing to treat some annual weeds if they become a problem. Um, grazing is always the one big question everybody has. Uh, again, no timelines can be really given here. It's going to be rainfall dependent, but we really want to allow those native species to go to seed uh, before we put any grazing in. And with that, thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Falk. Uh, Thank you for that presentation. Uh, up next, we have Jason Holt again, uh, going to talk some more about eco site descriptions, but this time he's demonstrating how to use them and how to incorporate them into, uh, into planning. Over to you, Holt. Okay, thanks, Charles. Um, we'll jump in on this one here. 
make sure I stay on time. Um, and I will, I saw some questions popping up about how to get these ecological sites. And, um, and I'll give you a few pointers on um, how you can use them for planning. Now, I'm gonna tell you about some things that I do with them. Um, these have a lot of bells and whistles. And so depending on what you're trying to do with a particular piece of property, or if you're just trying to learn the land, explore the land, a certain type of place, there's a lot you could do with them, but I'll, uh, I'll be pretty brief and just give you a few pointers. Okay, so first, how do you get to them? Um, there are many ways. So there's uh, the technology is, is really jumping ahead. It's, it's pretty slick. So all of the reference documents are housed in a database called EDIT or the Ecosystem Dynamics Interpretive Tool. And um, that is um, a database managed between the Hornada Experimental Range and New Mexico State University. You can go to their webpage and um, you can, there's a mapping function on there where if you zoom in close enough, you can um, and, and locate your property. You can choose the soil and, the, and it'll bring up the, and that map unit will show you what ecological sites are there. That's one way. Uh, Web Soil Survey, the NRCS tool that, that we use a lot. I'll do a demo of that just in, in a second here. Um, and then a couple of these other ways, there's a web page called Soil Web. Um, I really like using this one on my phone when I'm in the field. So I'll just get into Safari or whatever, and I'll go to this web page called Soil Web, and it'll bring up a map, and it'll show you your position on the map, and you can click down and zoom in to the soil map unit, click on it, and you'll eventually find out the ecological site and actually hot link to that site description if everything's working right. Uh, another thing you can do is in Google Earth, there's a layer that you can add called Soil Web Earth. And if you Google Soil Web Earth, I think you'll find that layer and um, you can add it in there and turn it on. And again, once you zoom in close enough, um, the map units for the soils will pop up and you can click on them and then start following the hot links to get the, the ESD. And then uh, Texas Forest Service has a, a web page called Map My Property is another way you can get it. Um, and again, there, if you turn on the soils theme, and then uh, there's a box below it that says visible and another one says identify. And if you zoom in close enough, you'll see all the soil map units, you can click on it. and It'll, it'll bring up a, a hot link to the ecological site that way. And uh, if you're having any trouble finding these, you should be able to talk to your local NRCS office. So let's see. All right, so now I'm gonna jump out and do a quick demo. Everything goes right here. All right, so this is the Web Soil Survey starting page you would go to. So you just pick the, uh, hit the big green button. All right, you can see I've been in there too long, so it kicked me out. And then you're going to want to draw an area of interest. So you can zoom in or, or find your place by, by some of these search features over here. For time's sake, I'm just going to draw off a small polygon. All right. And so we'll say that that is our ranch boundary right there. And then if you go to the tab that says um, Soil Data Explorer, jumping past the soils map, uh, this is a recent addition. You can see all the different map units here. I'm going to, I said I was going to zoom in. All right. Um, you can see all the different soil map units. Now you can click this tab. This is kind of a new feature that says ecological sites. And then hit view all ecological sites. And it's gonna bring up an ecological site map. Now I'm gonna zoom in just a little closer so we can see these map units. All right. And so let's look at this one. It's kind of hard to read. I'll zoom in a little closer. Okay, golly. You gotta have your glasses on to do this. Okay, so we'll look at this one, HSB. If you go down here, there'll be a table and you can find the map unit that you're trying to identify. So for HSB, the ecological site is Redland. You just click that hot link and it's gonna take you over to edit. Is that database I mentioned earlier. So this should pull up. Here's the ecological site description. The first thing I go down here and I go down and you can jump section by section, which these are all the things we talked about in the first presentation. I always hit all sections. 
So I can see the entire document. So it'll show you the extent and then I'll kind of breeze down here pretty quick. There's that climate data. There's a narrative on the historic climax plant community. Here's your state and transition model, so on and so forth. And there's some pictures of these different plant communities. All right, so let me jump back to my PowerPoint presentation. And I will present that. And I will tell it to look the other one. All right, and so I think that should be working right on everyone's end again. I go past my backup plan here in case I had internet problems. All right, so now let's talk about some uses of the ecological sites. All right, one thing um, that I like to use them for is plant identification. And so, um, you know, there's lots of tools out there now for plant ID. Uh, some of the photo recognition stuff that uh, on these apps on the iPhone right now, or whatever smartphone you have, um, are really slick. Um, and I use those a lot, but uh, what I'll do here is I'll, I'll, before I go out to a place I'm going to look at, I'll look at what plants I might expect to see there by looking at the historic climax plant community table. And for each one of these species, there will often be a hot link to US, uh, USDA plants. So you can click on that particular species and find out some more information about how to identify it. So in some ways, this is a, a way to narrow down um, the types of plants you might expect to see on the site. So, you know, the sweet of grasses, forbs, trees, so on and so forth. So that's, that's one way to do, do it. And those plants will often help you um, identify where that site is at as well. I'll kind of get into that. So I wanna build just a little bit on what Tim was talking about on indicator species or what some might call uh, diagnostic plants. So certain plants that occur on these sites might be indicators of features either in the soil or, or something else. So um, for instance, for instance uh, salinity is, is a big one. You know, there's certain plants that are well adapted to saline sites. Um, some plants will only grow on shallow soils. Uh, some, some stuff grows on clay, some stuff grows on sand. Wetness is a big one um, in terms of what plants you might see there. And then as you really get into the ecology of the site, some plants might indicate the stability of the plant community and some plants might indicate the past use of the site. And so these are things um, that will number one, help you identify the site. And then number two, tell you a little bit about whether, um, what, which one of those boxes that you're in in the state transition model and how hard it might be to get in and out of those boxes. So let's talk just a little bit more about this. So I've got three different ecological sites here uh, that occur in South Texas. And so, um, for instance, the site in the middle of your screen there um, is, is uh, probably like a shallow ridge or shallow sandy loam kind of site and Ceniso dominated. And so that plant community in the ESD probably has a narrative that talks about how it's very hard to change that plant community from something like grazing management alone or fire alone. And the other thing about it is it helps you to identify that site because that plant probably won't be um, nearly as prominent on some of the other sites. So, um, and that's one thing I wanted to say was, especially in flat areas where it's hard to see, where there's a lot of vegetation, it's harder um, especially in the older soil surveys where we had a lot of these tech, uh, technology we do now. Um, some of those older surveys, it's hard to, to see and get those lines just right. So it works both ways. These indicator plants tell you, you know, what you may uh, can and can't do with the site, but then they, help, they also help you identify the site if you're having a hard time because sometimes the lines aren't exactly in the right place or you're looking to do something, you know, say very specific, maybe a habitat project that only uh, occurs on a couple acres and so it might exceed the mapping of, a, of the soil survey, you know, in terms of that amount of detail. Um, the other thing I would say too is, uh, and, and, and I believe Tim touched on this, is some of these plants will indicate past use. So like where this gentleman's out collecting some data on a tight sandy loam site, um, if that site is dominated by some, you know, some species that are unpreferred you know, by livestock, like say red grama and prion and things like that, you know, we know there's probably some previous history 
of overgrazing that's occurred on that site. And so that might say something about that site's ability to respond, and whether or not reseeding might be needed or some sort of severe mechanical disturbance um, or more severe type disturbance to get it to respond. Okay, um, another thing, especially put, your, put yourself in the shoes of a new property owner. Um, if you have just purchased a place and you're trying to decide what the potential for your property is to respond to a treatment, I like to compare one ESD to the other in terms of productivity. So there'll these, be these plant productivity uh, tables. And again, this is total biomass produced. And so if I'm trying to decide between whether I'm gonna do um, a project on a sandy loam site versus a clay loam site, um, I might look at these tables to see where I'm gonna get the biggest bang for my buck if I do something. Now to do that, I would um, be careful to compare between the same plant communities and I don't know that this is always going to hold true, but the place I would start would be in this community 1.1. That's going to be that historic climax plant community. So comparing productivity between those two states might be a pretty good gauge way to do that. So you can do that with ESDs. You can do that with uh, soil series and web soil survey as well as another way to do it. But comparing the site productivity is, uh, is a really good um, tool. Now, Another thing you could do with the sites is estimate forage production. And I say that kind of tongue in cheek. Um, you wanna be very careful um, with doing that because there can be a wide range of production um, on the site. So even within one site, the, the production may vary several, you know, 500 pounds or more if it's in that one state in that one box. So you gotta ground truth it. Uh, you want to also look at historical records of how that site's been used, how many animals have been on there to get an idea, and then, um, you know, compare that back to the table. It can be a good tool if you're out there and forced to do this, especially at like an inopportune time of the year, like the early spring. Okay, so wrapping up, um, another thing, I think one of the guiding things of these ESDs, and one of the, the kind of the primary uses of them is to help develop a plan about changing the plant community to the desired state. And so um, you can look at these different um, state, these different states that the site could occur in and decide which one meets your needs the best. And you might, you might decide that, well, the one I'm in, you know, really suits my need the be needs the best. So it might uh, help you decide not to do something um, as well, which, you know, sometimes that can be huge cost savings. Uh, so that anyway, it helps you kind of understand where you're at and where you could possibly go with a specific site. All right, I will wrap up right there uh, for today. And I just wanna thank the soil scientists, the ecological site writers, and uh, those, uh, those, those, those folks that have the, the knowledge to write those sites um, for contributing to it. And my email address is right here on the slide too. If someone has a specific question, or wants to uh, connect with that local NRCS office, I'd be happy to do that. We are ready for our last presentation. Uh, our final speaker today is Dr. John Nelson Gammon, who has been on the faculty at Texas A&M University since 1991. He is currently a Regents Professor of Atmospheric Sciences and also serves as the Texas State Climatologist. He graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, receiving a PhD there in 1990. He does research on various types of extreme weather from droughts to floods, as well as air pollution and computer modeling. As Texas State Climatologist, he helps the state of Texas make the best possible use of weather and climate information through applied research, outreach, and service on state level communities or committees. Today he is here to talk about how our weather might be tied to ecology in his talk, there really is a new normal in three months. Thanks for sharing with us today, Dr. Nelson Gammon. Okay, um, thank you. Um, actually, let me share just my uh, presentation of slides here other than my entire desktop. Um, so the concept of climate normals was um, developed a um, long, long time ago with the idea of wanting to know what a particular climate was in a particular place for primarily agricultural applications, you know, knowing what crops could grow in a particular place, obviously is, has much broader uses than that in present time. And the 
um, standard is for climate normals to be calculated based on 30 years worth of climate data. And they get updated once per decade. The reason we're doing 30 years is because the climate can vary, can change. And so you want to have up-to-date information on what typically happens. Um, now, the agency that does that sort of calculation is called the National Centers for Environmental Information. That's part of NOAA, the same parent organization as the National Weather Service. And since we just finished a decade, they're in the middle of their calculations right now. And um, they expected to come out with the new normals in three months that will be used as our term of normal climate. Uh, so when you hear that temperature is a couple degrees above normal, they're talking about relative to these multi-decade normals that they calculate. So um, in uh, just the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about what that means in terms of the normals changing and what that means in the context of climate change and, for that matter, in the context of extreme weather. Um, some of you might be interested in some of the extreme weather that we had recently. Certainly, it's had big uh, ecological impact. So um, although it's slightly off topic, I just want to show you a couple of statistics from the recent cold wave. Um, here's a plot of the coldest days in Texas history and the year in which they occurred and the average minimum temperature in degrees Fahrenheit for selected stations across the state. By far, the coldest day was February 12th of 1899 where the average minimum temperature actually was below zero Fahrenheit statewide. And there are a few other cold days back in the um, 19th century, which is uh, the blue bars. Um, the gray bars are various occasions in the 20th century uh, up until the 1980s. Uh, number two is in 1989, which is sort of a good reference point for the recent freeze we had and other days in the 80s are in orange and then the recent one 2021 in yellow um, by this estimate it only comes out about 11th coldest in history but coldest since 1989 and that's for minimum temperature uh, but a lot of a lot of uh, things can tolerate just sort of brief cold temperatures it's when it stays cold for a longer time that it really starts to have an impact. So another way of looking at it is the coldest average temperature over the course of an entire day. And if we do that and we actually look at the average temperatures where people live, which is mainly central and eastern Texas, uh, February 15 comes out third coldest in history with records going back to about 1885 or so. Again, 1899 is the coldest, uh, but uh, in terms of how cold it was for many hours, uh, the cold snap we had recently comes in pretty close to 1989. And in fact, the 10th coldest day in history was the following day, uh, February 16th of 2021. Um, the coldest prolonged period was in 1983, which has three bars on this whole graph. And just as a, by the way, people have referred to 2011 as sort of a reference point. Um, 2011 really doesn't hold a candle to uh, 2021. Um, in some cases, that's literal. A lot more people were having to hold candles in 2021 than were in 2011. Okay, as I mentioned, climate normals Climate does change. This is uh, in red, a graph of temperatures over Texas compared to global temperatures in the other pastel colors over the past century plus. And if you look at warming trends, especially in the past 40 years or so, uh, going up um, across the state fairly uniformly. Uh, climate normals get calculated for specific locations. And I'll give you the example here for Dallas-Fort Worth. So here's um, the, the average daily low temperature over the past uh, 80 years in, at DFW airport or the Weather Bureau office back before they had an airport. The current climate normals 
are based on 1981 to 2010. So it's really an average of that 30 year period. And you can see you really wouldn't want to just use one year, or even just a few years, because there's a lot of variability from year to year. And um, the uh, and this is averaging over a whole season. So it shows you about this variability there can be. Um, the new climate normals are based on 1991 to 2020. So uh, when they come out in May, there'll probably be a lot of news stories about how the new normals are warmer than the old normals and how that means there's global warming and so forth and so forth. Um, that's true to some extent, but realistically what the change in the normals represents is the difference between what happened in the 1980s, which is included in the old normals, and what happened in the decade of the 2010s, which is included in the new normals. So it is sort of reflective of climate change, but it's a pretty crude measure of it because there's a lot of variability from decade to decade also that gets into it. Um, in this particular example, um, the average temperature um, was about 36 in the 1980s and the average temperature was about 39 in the 2010s. So um, considering these years don't change at all between the old and new, that corresponds to a one degree increase between the old normal and the new normal. Uh, and you'll see that sort of thing happening all across the state. Um, generally speaking, the 1980s were a relatively cold decade compared to the 2010s. Uh, 1990s were fairly warm. So when we go another decade, uh, and the next set of new normals, there probably won't be nearly as large a change uh, with the update. Um, now, as I mentioned, we do we express current climate conditions relative to normal. So, um, for example, the seasonal outlook for temperatures uh, for the spring, the summer, the fall, and next winter all have predictions of above normal temperatures for Texas. Uh, and that's actually an easy forecast to make. The likely temperatures in 2021 are going to be a lot warmer than the average over 1981 to 2010. Um, in May, not so much. The, the normals have been updated, and so it won't be quite as likely for temperatures to be above normal. Effectively, it will be a new normal, and the anomalies will be relative to that new normal rather than the old normal. Um, so it'll seem like when we say, ah, gee, a given day is uh, two degrees above normal, uh, that'll actually correspond to a warmer temperature in the future than it does in the past because normal will be warmer also. Uh, we do normals for rainfall also. That's a lot more erratic. Uh, even though there's a long-term wetting trend for most of the state, it's possible some normals will go up, some normals will go down. Maybe the wettest month of the year is gonna change just because you're only looking at a 30 year average. Um, for plant purposes, agriculture purposes, the normals will also include average dates of the last freeze and the first freeze and the last frost, the first frost. And they also will be in probabilistic senses. So you'll look at the, uh, you know, when is the likelihood of the earliest freeze, when you're more likely than not to be past the date of the earliest freeze and so forth. So it's actually going to be quite a good resource for horticultural activities uh, with the normals uh, being produced by NCEI. And I encourage you to uh, take a look at that if uh, you're caring about planting dates and that sort of thing. Uh, so I'll just leave you with my um, contact information here. You can get hold of me. Well, not with that email. It would be better to actually have EDU. Um, but we're also available, we have a website, we have a dormant social media presence. I'm a little old for social media, but hey, that's the way it goes. Um, so be happy to answer questions if we have time for it. Let's see, I see one question come in on the chat um, and I see a few questions on the Q and A. Let me start with the Q and A. Uh, difference between, and interrupt me when we're out of time. Uh, moderators. Uh, different between frost and freeze. Um, frost is typically when temperature gets below 36 degrees, that means frost can form in the ground. A freeze is when the temperature actually does drop below freezing. 
And a hard freeze might be defined as temperature you're getting below 28 degrees. Um, easy way to get local climate data for past months. Uh, the easiest way, I think, is to go to the National Weather Service and find the website for your local National Weather Service office. You'll find a tab for climate data, and there's a lot of information there, including reports on the daily values and monthly averages for past months going back several years. And in terms of how often the USDA hardiness zones maps gets updated, those, um, well, I can't speak for the USDA, um, but they tend to be based on longer time scales than just the 30 years. So I don't know if they'll be updating it based on these new normals. Um, if they do, it might be several months before that, that update kicks in. Um, I will mention that the um, that, you know, our, our most recent extreme cold was 1989, and now here it was in 2021. So the normal period sort of starts after that last cold snap and before the current ones. So it might actually be underestimating the risk of extreme cold um, when, when in, based on those normals. And let's see, last question, is the average first frost, the median first frost rate? Yes, um, they use medians for that purpose. And uh, that works real well for most of the state. Um, there is some funkiness in the lower Rio Grande Valley because you can go through some years without any uh, frost or freeze whatsoever. Uh, and the way they calculated it last time and probably this time is um, the median frost date in years in which a frost occurred. So that probably overestimates the risk of frost compared to what actually is happening. And uh, those are all the questions. Oh, why do they use 30 years instead of say 50? Uh, I don't know. Maybe when they started it, they had 30 years of data that were widespread and they did it and it just sort of became conventional. There's no particular reason for 30 years nowadays other than it seems to sort of work. Although if you actually wanted to know what was most likely temperature, most likely rainfall, you'd probably want to use a shorter time than 30 years just because climate is actually changing on a more rapid time scale. There's, there's one last question, then we're going to wrap up. It says, what is the chance of mega drought? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we have a paper on that. Um, you can Google my name and the journal name, which is Earth's Future. And I'll, rather than give a long-winded answer here, I'll just say, uh, Google it, look it up, and read all about it. <laughs> can you give that link one more time? Um, yeah, just Google my name and the journal name is called Earth's Future. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Dr. Nielsen Gamma. We really appreciate that. And thanks again to our door prize sponsors, Bear Crop Science, Corteva AgriScience, Douglas King Seeds, Native American Seed Company, Pogue Agri Partners, Texas, Begra Texas Brigades, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service for donating those prizes. And we just want to thank everybody for attending our second Plant Party webinar. Again, Plant Party is a quarterly webinar training series brought to you by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, and the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, and sponsored by the Renewable Resources Education Act. We'd love to have you join us next time. We'll be sending a link to a short survey by email, or you can type in the address you see there on the screen in chat box. Um, Please fill this short survey out and be sure to tell us what plant related topics you would be interested in having more training on. The next plant party is currently scheduled for Wednesday, June 23rd, 2021. We plan on keeping the same format of 15 minute presentations. So please mark your calendars and look for more information. Thank you so much.